I'm Allison Singer with the Autism Science Foundation. We are here at the International Meeting for Autism Research with Portia McCoy. She's a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. Ben Philpott's lab at the University of North Carolina. She received an Autism Science Foundation postdoctoral fellowship to support her work looking at synaptic structural plasticity in the ASD mouse model. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So we've been hearing a lot about the role of synapses here at IMFAR. Could you talk a little bit about why synapses are important in, in autism? Yeah, so it's very interesting in that while there is a um, gross enlargement of the brain in autistic individuals, there isn't any like gross developmental um, abnormality that we can find. And so that would suggest that there's really some disorder at the synaptic level. And so as part of my project, we're actually looking at the structural plasticity of these synapses in ASD models. Now you're looking specifically at a gene called the UBE3A gene. Mm -hmm. What is the role of that gene in autism? So the UBE3A is a E3 ubiquitin ligase, and its role is to take a ubiquitin uh, molecule and attach it to proteins that will then either modify their function or can actually target them for degradation. So what we think is um, going on with UB3A in autism is that an overexpression of the gene is targeting proteins to be either highly degraded or highly modified so that they're not functioning properly. Another um, autism spectrum disorder, Angelman syndrome, is caused by the loss of UB3A. And so this would be a, this would result in a um, decrease in the protein degradation or a decrease in the modification of the proteins. And so what's the model here? How do you make the mouse and what, what do we learn from the mouse model? So um, UB3A is a paternally imprinted gene, which means that's only expressed off the maternal allele. And so it's a, it's a really neat mouse model in that you only have to knock out the mother's copy and then you can get an affected mouse. Um, what my project does is I cross these maternally deficient mice with a Thi1 GFP promoter so that I can visualize the um, dendritic spines of these animals. And a big benefit of this is that it will allow me to not only longitudinally look at the spine development over time, but I can then use treatments on these mice to try and rescue the phenotype so that we can progress the drug screening further and faster in the animal model before we take it to human clinical trials. And how long does the whole process take from the time you make the mouse until the time that it might be ready for real use and real people? How long is the process? Um, you know, making a mouse is not as long as it used to be, although, uh, you know, I've been very fortunate in that the mouse models that we've had have been already made. So um, the Thai one promoter GFP mouse was made by Guoping Fang, and the UB3A uh, maternal deficient mouse was made by Yong Wei Jing. And so I've been very fortunate because I can just take the mice and then cross them and use the pups. But as far as, you know, like the drug screening, um, you know, I mean, it can take a very long time to get any kind of hit and then um, a hit being a drug that could potentially work. And then you first have to prove that there's a phenotype in the mouse model and then use the drug to try and recover it. Um, you know, I mean, it's still on the order of years, but being able to know what the drug is actually doing and how it is affecting the mouse model gives us a great insight into how it will affect the human population so that we can target therapies better for specific genetic um, causes of autism. And how does your specific project fit into that larger model? What will we learn from your project that will really play a role in, in moving this forward? So the basis of my project is to um, not only determine whether there is a structural plasticity deficit in the ASD mouse models, but it will then provide the groundwork for this um, drug screening later on so that we can look at not only the electrophysiological or electrical activity recovery of function, but we can look at the structural recovery of function because both of those things are very important when it comes to any type of learning and memory. So we are here at IMFAR. It's been a very energetic, exciting IMFAR. What has been your favorite part? Um, I think that g getting the opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one time with Tom Insel at the uh, ASD SAD <laughs> dinner was probably an opportunity that I wouldn't have had otherwise. You know, getting to, to pick his brain on the status of funding levels as well as you know, like the best career path 
um, grants, opportunities, and things like that was just a once in a lifetime opportunity. And have you had an opportunity to really network with other scientists and find out what's going uh, on in yes, other fields? Yes, being able to, you know, because I'm very much a basic science researcher, you know, I work on, at a bench every day, but being able to interact with the clinicians that actually study the um, individuals that have the same genetic characteristics that my animals have has been amazing because it really helps, you know, build that, bridge that gap between my work and the human side. And so that's something that I don't think a lot of basic scientists get to do. Well, we are really looking forward to seeing the results of your study. We're so glad we're able to fund your work and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me.